And I'd already said, I'm going to say it a lot. Serving the God of love is not a part-time job. And when I, when I ask God for what he wants me to have, I get a lot of help. The trick is for me to get to the right request. And it would appear that help me that I don't judge anyone is one of the right requests because I got massive help immediately. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Bienvenidos from Studio AA Deep in the Heart of Texas. That was the voice of Mr. Scott L that you heard at the beginning of this here episode. And you are going to hear so much more from him in just a moment. And I know you're going to enjoy this one. Uh, But first things first, this episode is brought to you by Jill and Laura and Rich. And what you may ask, did Jill and Laura and Rich do? Well, they went to our website, www.soberspeak.com. They clicked on the little yellow donate tab and they made a contribution. So thank you so much, Jill and Laura and Rich for your contributions uh, and helping us keep the virtual lights on. We sure do appreciate it. All right, so you're going to enjoy Scott L., like I said, in just a moment uh, so much. Uh, but just before I introduce Scott, I, just, uh, I was coming up here to record today, and, and I'll be honest, I really didn't feel like it. Um, I've just had one of those days, uh, it started this morning and there was some emails that went out and I'm not going to go into the details because anyway, things did not go mm, well, I, how do I, how do I put this? I was not happy with the tone of the emails and it threw me for a loop and it put me into some fear, fear of financial fear, all kinds of fear. Um, And then I went to the meeting and there was a gentleman there named Josh. He was chairing the meeting and he read from June 9th of the daily reflections and the, the subject line in daily reflections on June 9th is living in the now, because that is what began to happen. I started living in the future, uh, horribleizing as they may call it and thinking about what may or may not occur. And of course it was all bad. Um, and anyway, when Josh was reading that, uh, it it talked about one day at a time. Uh, it was out of living sober. And, and so there was a line toward the end of it and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there was somebody comparing, life in the fellowship to be to each day being like a rose unfurling. And they said in here, each stage of the petals unfold unfolding can bring wonder and delight. If I do not interfere or let my expectations override my acceptance. And this brings serenity. I'm going to read that again. It's talking about the rose and it says each stage of the petals unfolding can bring wonder into light. If I do not interfere or let my expectations override my acceptance and this brings serenity. 
And it just kind of hit me that uh, I, I'm not real good at it or perfect at it by any means, but I have a tendency to take events that happen and interfere with the process and what is going on. And I guess I'm thinking to myself, if I just do what I'm supposed to do and I do what I know is right and there are events happening outside of me that I can't control, if I was spiritually fit, I would not let that bother me. But that's why I keep coming back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's why I keep listening to you people. And it's why I have to keep remembering that this life is truly one day at a time, one moment at a time. And I need to learn how to live in the now. And life gives me exam not examples, but it gives me lessons in that arena pretty much every day. Sometimes they're more than another, uh, sometimes more than others. But, uh, and then, uh, oh, and my friend Mac was sharing in the meeting and I call him Mac because he's got a really deep Southern accent. I mean, really deep, like deepest of the deep Texas accents. Uh, and he says, my name's Mac and I'm an alcoholic. And he was, he was sharing and he said something to this effect. And then it was like, you know, I had really so many bad things happen to me last week. And if I could remember what they were, I would tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, like, in other words, I've had these kind of feelings. I don't know how many times, like uh, umpteen million. Um, but if I get into the next week, sometimes I can't even remember what I was so worried about at that particular moment. And then my friend Tammy came up to me in the same meeting and, uh, I love Tammy. She's just, Oh, just a jewel. And, um, Tammy said, she goes, Hey, I've been listening to sober speak lately. I, I'm real. Oh, by the way, Tammy's on, uh, she has an, an episode on sober speak. It's probably like 150 or so ago, but she's been on before and she did a great job. And she said to me, do you ever feel like pressure to get the, uh, to, to get another episode out? And I said, well, quite honestly, yeah, I do sometimes. And this was one of those days where walking up here, I just did not want to do this. But I also told her this. I said, this is, this is the key to it, though, is that if and when I do it, if I, you know, it's like not wanting to go to a meeting or not wanting to do the next right thing. But sometimes when I do those next right things, I feel better about myself and it gives me a little bit more esteem for lack of a better word. It gives me a confidence to move on. It, it, it increases my connection with God and with you. So I do it. So I come up here and I do it because I know that it helps me to get out of myself and my little pea brain. And I was also able to come home and talk to the lovely Mrs. M. And uh, we just had a, a nice little chat. And we were, and she was able to reassure me that everything was all right. We're going to be okay. You know, all these little fears that I get going on up in my head are uh, just that. Uh, you know, I don't live in reality a lot of times. Or even if I'm living in reality, sometimes I don't have the proper perspective, right? It's all about how I look at it. Do I look at my situation as, okay, this is just one of the petals unfolding? Or do I look at it as chicken little and the sky is falling and things are coming down around me uh, and it's all going to go to crap, <laughs> and so that's why I keep coming back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I try to be as vulnerable as I can. I try to keep sharing about what's going on inside me. And that's, I think that's all I got to say. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see here in a second. But let's go on to Mr. Scott L. Thanks for listening to my, uh, I don't know, what do you call it? I, not complaining, just just getting it out there, right? Anyway, Scott L. is on the pod today, and this one is called Serving the God of Love is Not a Part-Time Job. 
Scott has been sober for 38 years, and he resides in Nashville, Tennessee. All right, folks, this one is truly chock full of nuts. We talk about Scott's battle with throat cancer. Um, We talk about what Scott calls the source of all anger, God's will. Oh, and Scott has been in the Air Force, and we talk about his time as not only in the Air Force, but his time as a circuit speaker in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm always kind of like interested in that stuff. Scott talks in detail about some of the mistakes he has made. He talks about the subject of judgment. And one of my favorite lines from this episode is, life is a school, love is the lesson. That's, that Scott talked about that. Let me say that again. Life is a school, love is the lesson. So, now for today, I am not going to have... Uh, any listener feedback on the end, but I'm sure we will pick up uh, next week with some listener feedback. I've got, eh, anyway, you know, I've just got a busy schedule this week. All right. So anyway, no listener feedback today, but I know you're going to enjoy Scott. And uh, I, oh, what I usually say when I, at the end of listener feedback. So if I don't, so since I'm not talking to you, keep coming back. It works if you work it. And may God bless you and keep you until then. Enjoy Scott L. Okay, everybody. So today, this is an interview that I've been looking very, very, very forward to. We are sitting here with Mr. Scott L. So Scott, I'm going to let you go ahead, introduce yourself, give you sobriety date if you will wish, and tell people where you live in this great land of ours, please. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm alcoholic. Uh, I'm sober since the 28th of June of 1984, which is a pretty good bit over 38 years. And that's a long time for a guy that only agreed to 28 days. <laughs> and uh, and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm very happy about that. And we had this scheduled one other time, speaking in Nashville, Tennessee. And the morning we were scheduled to actually record, you had a power outage there, right? Yeah, we had some pretty serious storms go through and they they wiped out the power. And uh, yeah, I would like, if you don't mind, I'd like to open anything I do with a quote from Lois Wilson, who said that in the moments of silence before the prayer that she always invited God to the meeting. And I'd like to do that. I'd like to invite anyone who's listening uh, to do that. And if you don't have a God, let me recommend you borrow mine. I recommend him very highly. He's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> and um you can address him as a God of God's limited understanding. We'll just take a moment and do that. And we'll just see what happens. Let's take a moment. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. you doing that. So there, there's a few reasons I've been looking forward to this. First of all, Uh, I don't know if you even know him or not. You did a workshop recently and there was a gentleman named Jason F who actually referred me over to you. And he, uh, we went back through some uh, communication via email and such. He really enjoyed your workshop. Um, And you have been around, as you mentioned, 38 years, but not only have you been around for 38 years, you've been very, very involved in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, So why don't you talk a little bit, bit then about what you have seen over the years. What are some of the differences? What do you see is the same? Just talk to me a little bit about that. Well, um, I'll tell you one of the differences. Uh, I complained to my sponsor when I was over about six months. I said, there's over 100 people, members here. And there's only three or four of us to do all of the work. What is this garbage about AA members all being willing? He said, oh, they're all willing. I said, no one listen to me. He said, 2% are willing to work. The other 98 are willing to let them. (laughs) And your instructions are to be part of the two, to be sure that the men you sponsor are part of the two and make the other 98 welcome when they get back from their next slip. (laughs) Those are my instructions and I understand them. The numbers are much better than that. But uh, the concept is so valid. Right. Like I think one of the things that I have seen around me is that the, the recovery rate is increasing. And I think it's because there's more and more focus on the big book and on the 12 steps. 
and less focus on don't drink and try to save sober on meetings. Mm. And I think that's why, at least around me, it's just growing at a phenomenal rate. So I want to talk about uh, something that we spoke about before you actually got on the podcast. And that is, we talked about your, your voice and the shape that it's in. I get, I'm thinking compared to what it used to be. And I did not know this, but you are dealing with and battling throat cancer. Is that what you're saying? Correct? No, no, my, they, uh, they wiped it out. The, uh, the throat cancer is gone. They, they checked me, uh, about every four months, I was checked about a month ago, and it's it's gone. But they it was I was diagnosed in twenty uh, June of twenty. They took my teeth, uh, which I've worked all my life to keep my teeth in good shape, yeah. and they took them all uh-huh. because they did so much radiation in my face. They killed my jawbone, and um, the jawbone is still there, but it's dead. And you can't have live teeth in a dead jawbone. They tell me I believed them, mm-hmm. and. Um, so they took my job on, they did radiation and chemo um, on me for a pretty good period of time. And I now have so much scar tissue in my throat, I can't swallow anything thicker than applesauce. I live on chocolate and sure. And, but don't feel sorry for me because I don't. Because I'm faced with two choices. I can either look at the fact that I'm on a liquid diet the rest of my life, or I can look at the fact that I get to live the rest of my life. I have made my choice. Don't feel sorry for me. I don't. But watching you eat is not the most, my favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to ask you also about your, your bow tie. Do you always wear a bow tie? I wear a bow tie seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. I started it about three years ago. I've always liked them. My dad taught me how to tie a bow tie uh, before I started shaving. I've always liked them. And I just got a wild hair and I thought, I'm just going to start wearing a bow tie every day. And I do. And I've got a beautiful collection of bow ties and and, uh, not too many people can see it, but the socks match the bow tie. (laughs) Those are beautiful socks. Always, always, always got to be coordinated. And actually, because I'm wearing a ponytail, my hair, Bob, the thing that holds my ponytail matches the color too. (laughs) <laughs> I'm well, or I'm well accessorized. <laughs> if I had cufflinks, which I do occasionally, they would match also. <laughs> so do you actually tie the bow ties yourself? They're not the kind where you clip on. Listen, let me, let me look. That's like <laughs> asking a woman if she's pregnant, you can't win that. All right. All right. If you ask a guy, if it's a clip on bow tie, if it is, you've embarrassed him. <laughs> if it's not, you've insulted him. And you will notice, you will notice that the bow tie is not tied perfectly. You see how this is yeah, sticking out here? Yeah. I learned that from Churchill. He wore a bow tie every night, but they're never perfect. And it's so nobody asked you if you tied it. The clip-ons are always perfect. <laughs> so there. So thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. A lot of times when I speak, when I get through, I untie it. Yeah. Just so people. Not because it's tight, because I want them to know I tied it. <laughs> And I and I have to ask also about that ornateness behind you. What what is that beautiful piece of? Uh, that's actually two. There, it's called shisham wood, which is very similar to rosewood. It's two big wooden room divider screens that I brought back from from India. Uh, back when I was flying for the Air Force, I was pilot command of a four engine jet, and it it seems that when the pilot command says to the loadmaster sergeant. These screens are going on this last pallet. That's where they go. <laughs> yeah. I want to tell you, too, you mentioned my voice earlier. I do not recognize my own voice today. Because of the radiation, it literally took away the high range of my voice. It affected my vocal cords. I used to be a pretty decent singer. I mean, not by Nashville standards, but, you know, by Des Moines. But, um, <laughs> but that's gone. And I do not recognize my own voice. Yeah, so I have heard uh, talks of you from the past, uh, and it does sound uh, a little bit different. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. From the inside, it's a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you mentioned being a pilot there. W- yeah. Why don't you tell folks a little bit about your history in terms of uh, you, you're in the Air Force, correct? Yeah, I flew for the Air Force for five years. Um I've been through the speed of sound 10 or 12 times, I guess. Um, 
I, uh, I flew a four engine jet all over the world. I flew around the world twice in the same month. Mm. One time, you know, people are saying the world's flat. It's round. Trust me. I checked twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, I flew, a, a, a I flew in, uh, Southeast Asia. I flew the original side firing gunship in the Delta Puff the magic dragon. I also flew an intelligence mission over Laos, uh, and the pres- it was cl- so classified we weren't even supposed to pray about it because God didn't have a high enough security clearance. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the president was on TV twice a week saying we were not in Laos. Well, I was. Yeah, it was one of those deals. Right. And uh, and that was in active alcoholism. And I think uh, there's no way for me to not believe there's a God because without divine intervention, guys like me don't survive 2,500 hours of flying time and active alcoholism. Mm. And I am, I am quite, I'm very much not proud to tell you I flew drunk and I flew bad drunk once. Uh, I don't know how many times by today's 0.08 DUI statistic. I have no idea, Mm -hmm. no idea. Uh, And most people don't get to live their dream. I got to throw mine back. I, I resigned my commission after five years. I'm honorably discharged. Um, and I think it probably saved my life. It was a question of time until I was going to do something bad. So I just happened to be uh, walking by okay, my wife. I call her the lovely Mrs. M. And I, I know you're married as well. Oh, Linda is her name. Is that correct? We separated, uh, Come, I guess it's two years ago this month. Well, sorry about that. I did not know that. No, it was very amicable. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to get together here shortly and have coffee. Okay. We're, yeah. We'll give her my we, best. We literally grew apart, which is kind of an interesting term. Okay. So, uh, so, so I'm, I want to go, I want to come back to that. I, I was watching, okay. so I was watching the lovely Mrs. M had a, uh, she was watching just downstairs and, and, I, and I've never seen it, but I happened to be walking by as I was coming up here and they had the, uh, the second Top Gun, whatever that's called, with Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. So, are those similar to the types of aircraft that you were flying when you were in the Air in, Force? In the original Top Gun, there was a black airplane that they said was a MiG. It wasn't a MiG, and if I sound confident, because I've got over a hundred missions in that airplane, I'm pretty sure I know what it was. It was not a MiG. So, yeah. In the first Top Gun movie, uh, the the the, uh, the bad guys were in the. They said it was a MiG. It was actually the Air Force's F five T thirty eight. It's the same airplane with a different cockpit. And I've got, I think, a hundred and three rides in that. Wow, most of them by myself. Okay, so I want to go back then to what was referenced just a moment ago with you and Linda okay. and separating. Uh, yeah. you, you tell me what you want to tell me about that. Yeah, she uh, and we did well together for a long time. Um, How many years were you married? About 20. Um, I'll tell you what happened. Um, Being what we in the fellowship refer to as a circuit speaker fell out of the sky on me when I was sober 10 years. I didn't do anything to earn it. I didn't ask for it. Um, And and it was a privilege to do. It's always a privilege to serve this fellowship. But unfortunately, it was feeding something in me that needed to be starved. And I developed an alter ego I call St. Scott of the Microphone. And uh, (laughs) very, very dangerous fellow. And in about 2004, I started getting involved in Internet pornography. And I couldn't tell anybody about it because of this persona that I had. Couldn't tell my sponsor, couldn't tell my road dogs. It got worse and worse. And finally, a young lady suggested she and I should do something, and I violated my marriage vows. And one of the things I've learned from that is that the first step in a bad direction is not a problem. It's the second one. It's the second one. I make the first step in a bad direction. If I tell the team, if I go to prayer, if I do the things I'm supposed to do, it just turns into a little lesson. If I don't do that, the second step in the bad direction is a bad one. And I took the second and third and went on and on. Hmm. And Linda and I tried to hold it together for over a year. Um, I guess it was in 2009 that it blew up. 
and uh, we had a we had a lot of therapy. We did a lot of things, and in eleven, she divorced me, and uh, the color went out of my life. Uh, a fellow named Joe from Florida, who you need to get on here, hired me to work in his company for a year, knowing I think that I couldn't do the job. She and I got back together in fifteen. We didn't remarry, and uh, we're doing pretty well. Although I don't think she ever got past that, I, and I don't know that. She nursed me through this this radiation and chemo, which is really something. I mean, it is rough as a stucco toilet seat. I, if they had told me, if they'd been able to explain to me how hard that was going to be on the body, I might have told them to make me comfortable and get my affairs in order if I'd known how hard it really was. And she nursed me through that. And then... After that, we were out the other side of it. Finally, one morning, she rolled over and said, you know what? I don't think you can be the man you need to be and the man I need you to be concurrently. And I think you ought to move out. It was her place. And I said, it talked about, about five seconds. I said, you know what? I think you might be right. And um, I had a place to go. I have had power of attorney. My sister has been a mental patient for a long time, and uh, I had had to put her in assisted living to save her life. And I was getting her house ready to sell. So I moved in and uh, I'm in her will for it. And I've got power of attorney. It's in effect my place. And I've been living here since. And that was April two years ago. Mm -hmm. And we meet together. We meet about once a month or once every six weeks and have a cup of coffee and chat. Um, I'm still grandpa to, to the three grandsons on her side. I'm the only, I've, I've been grandpa all their lives. So I'm trying to figure out how to, what would you say that you've taken away from that? I mean, what are some of the major uh, lessons that you took away? The first one I already told you is the first step in a bad direction is not the problem. It's the second one. That the, the step says, and when we were wrong, not if. It's a when question. So I got to be at peace with that. Um, what else did I take away? I think the most expensive lessons are the ones that are paid for in the currency of someone else's pain. And I need to remember one of the gifts I got some time ago, I want to talk about this. Um, I was sitting by a stream. Actually, it's a stream that runs across her property. And I was sitting there one day looking, just sitting. And I saw a storm. I looked over, I'm looking at that cloud. And it occurred to me, every drop of rain in that storm is following God's will perfectly. And across the stream, I see a tree. I well, so is a tree. And so is the bird in the tree. And so are the minnows in the stream. Why can't I follow God's will perfectly? They are. Why can't I? I got my answer. The answer is I am. I am. I'm convinced to the depths of my soul that it's not my job to be perfect. And, and if somebody thinks it's their job to be perfect, I wish you the best. It's going to be tough. But if it's not my job to be perfect, what's my job? My job is to make mistakes. Oh, and they've sent the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And they, all my life, they've been saying, we learn from our mistakes. And it's not true. Not true. Guys like me learn from living with the results of our mistakes. Mm. If you hold that thought and read the 12 steps, half of them, four, five, eight, nine, 10, 11, are about me embracing the results of my mistakes, which is where the learning occurs. Not in the making of the mistake, but in the making of the amend and the living into the result. That's where the learning occurs. So this is the learning procedure, as I understand it today, for a guy like me. One, make a mistake. Two, be notified I made a mistake. I don't always know. Three, own the mistake. Yeah, that was me. And if they only know 80%, I got to tell them the other 20. That's how I own the mistake. Plus, if I don't tell them the other 20, when they find out about it later, we're going to go through this again. Might as well do it all now. Own the mistake. Three. Four, consult a spiritual advisor about how to five, make the amend. Usually, not always, there's an amend that comes along with the lesson. Six, embrace the lesson, because the lesson comes with the making of the amend. Seven, share the lesson. That's what sets it. Eight, when I share the lesson, I got to tell you I made a mistake. If I just share the lesson, I'm preaching and nobody wants to hear it. When I stand as a sinner beside the sinner, he can hear me. Eight, nine, 
make the next mistake. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's why I'm here. (laughs) I believe God's will for me is to make mistakes. It's my mission. It's why I was put in this skin. There's some other parts to it. Um, It's to learn to love. My sponsor says, life is a school, love is a lesson. I believe that. It's to learn to be of service. It's to learn to be of love. It's to learn to treat you guys like brothers and sisters. It's to learn to share love and joy. One of the things I learned from, from this bout with cancer was I learned that the assignment of spreading love and joy doesn't go away based on my circumstances. My circumstance with radiation to the point my throat was so red. Um, on one occasion, I went in on a Friday to have the radiation done to my throat. And the doctor looked at me and he said, I just can't do it to you today. I'm going to put salve on that. Go away. It was so bad. What I learned was it's still my responsibility to, uh, to spread joy, that spreading love and joy. Serving the God of love is not a part-time job. It's a yes or no question. And uh, this is the mask that I wore. <laughs> it has a clown nose on it. It's a, yeah. it's a clown nose a little bit bigger than a ping pong ball. <laughs> and I, uh, I put it on there with a safety pin. And um, that's the one that I wore. And I still wear it. We have to wear them at the BA. I wear it all the time. And I've been carrying clown noses for a long time because what I learned is when the traffic comes to a stop in downtown Nashville on the interstate, instead of sitting there fuming, I put on a clown nose and I reach into my other pocket and I pull out one of these little jars of bubbles like they give at weddings. And and I start blowing bubbles out the window to get the attention of the other drivers. They see the clown nose and respond as you are with laughter. And laughter's content. And I start laughing. We're still stuck in traffic. I've turned it into a party. <laughs> I also carry the bubbles all the time. I'm walking to the grocery store and there's a mom there with some some kids. And they're good kids. They're just having a hard day. And I start blowing bubbles and the kids come on point like a bird dog. They will lock onto the bubbles. They'll stop screaming. And I walk up to the mom because I'm a stranger. I don't give the kids. I go up to the mom and say, can the kids have the bubbles? I give them to the mom. Or what happens then? It changes their lives. Who else does it change? Me. Who else? Everyone that witnesses it. And what I've discovered, the principle that underlies is when I'm sloshing love and joy all over you, it splatters onto me every time. That's right. And it's a permanent assignment. And the fact that I'm going through chemo and radiation does not change that assignment. It just doesn't. So, yeah, that's what I learned. Yeah. So we were talking a little bit before we started and we started to get into a, a, a discussion. I just wanted to make sure I heard it on the podcast. And you talked about the source of all anger. Yeah, I've just sort of, I've, I've found it. I have discovered the source of all anger. What is that? It comes from being sure I'm right. I have never been angry while I wasn't absolutely certain I was right. And being right comes from having passed judgment. I have to judge to be right, to be angry. So judgment is the grandmother of anger. And if I don't ever judge, I don't ever get angry. And that hit me. It was in January of 15. And one morning, I just realized how judgmental I am. I walk through. I'm just going through life judging constantly. And it occurred to me, God didn't want me to judge. Step 11 talks about knowledge of his will and the power to carry it out. I believe it's God's will for me not to judge. So I added that to my morning prayer. It was there this morning. Bless me, please, that I don't judge anyone, that I might love them all as you do, especially those that I find unlovable. Because you see, I have times when I'm unlovable and I don't need you to judge me. Then I'm probably judging myself. That's when I need you to love me the most. So when you are unlovable must be when you need to love the most. And I've already said, I'm going to say it a lot. Serving the God of love is not a part-time job. And when I, when I ask God for what he wants me to have, I get a lot of help. The trick is for me to get to the right request. And it would appear that, that help me that I don't judge anyone is one of the right requests because I got massive help immediately. I'm not batting a thousand on it, but I am on the all-star team. I'll be in the hall of fame. It's amazing. (laughs) 
how much less judging I do. And because I don't judge, I don't get right. And because I don't get right, I don't get angry. I don't want to be angry. But that's only half. The other half is I also don't judge any situations. I ask him for help on that. I don't get to I don't get to say a situation is good or bad. I can say I like it or I don't like it. Absolutely. Good or bad? I don't know. I don't know. And that has freed me up. So if I can go back to the other piece I was talking about. So I have my own permission to make mistakes. It's okay with me that I make mistakes. I think it's my assignment, quite frankly, because I know what I'll do with them. You just heard it. I will absolutely do that. That's what I do. But that's only half the freedom. The other half is you have my permission to make mistakes. That's the, that's the album on half. Because if I got a rope on you holding you in line and you jump out, you pull me with you. So if I will allow your behavior to affect how I feel, I am now a prisoner of your behavior. And I don't want to be a prisoner anymore. You have my permission to make mistakes. You have my permission to make mistakes that appear to hurt me. The fact is, you can't hurt me. I'm sitting in God's lap. I'm immune. Okay, so let me ask you this. I love everything that you just said. As you probably see, I was taking a lot of notes, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, get it all in. I want to remember it. But as you know, and I'm. This is a, a very well known saying in AA, right? It getting it from the head to the heart, and making that particular journey can be tough. So when is it and what prompted you to be able to get away from just having it in your head and actually practicing that on a day-to-day basis? Was there a time? It started in January 2015, that morning when I recognized how judgmental I was. I'm in my 70s. I wear a ponytail. I'll judge you for having a funny haircut. Before the cancer, I was 60 pounds overweight. I would judge you for being heavy. I just, suddenly I could see it. Suddenly I could see it. And when I started asking for help on that, it got better immediately. But there's only one day I can do it right, and that's today. And I still make mistakes, but I'll tell you what happens now. So I'm walking to the grocery store, and I see a lady that, well, she's well-nourished. Let's say it that way. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll see that, and I'll think, boy, that's not a trend. And immediately... Immediately, this is what flashes into my mind. Wait a minute, Scott. You think that's unattractive? What do you think she thinks? That poor woman has fought her weight. She's fought it all her life. She's fought it to here. And if you were trapped in that body like she is, you may not be doing anywhere near as well as she is with that. Try to imagine how hard that is for her every morning to wake up trapped in that body. Blessings on that child, Father. Forgive me for judging her. Thank you that I now have a sadness for how hard that's got to be for her. Blessings on that child. Blessings on her. Blessings on her. And I can't change me. I can't make me the guy that does what you just heard. But when I ask God for what he wants me to have, I get help. I get a lot of help. And that's apparently one of the right requests. Because I have that experience occasionally, not near as often as I used to, not near as often as I used to. I used to get mad at you in traffic. I was on the way to work the other morning and it's still dark when I'm driving and I'm, I'm doing 75 on the interstate. This guy that passed me must have been doing 100. He was doing every bit of 100. And I used to get mad at that. And then, and then it, what flashes through my mind is, for all I know, his wife's laying in the back seat in the final stages of labor and having trouble. Or maybe his son is sitting next to him trying to stem the flow of arterial blood and they're raising their life. I don't know. I don't know. Bless me that I don't judge them. What I've discovered is that anger and love never travel together. They are mutually exclusive. Sadness and love do. If I find myself angry, it says on page 87 of the book, pause when, when agitated. Actually, it says pause when agitated or doubtful, but I'm an alcoholic. I'm never doubtful. I'm seldom right, but I'm never in doubt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> pause when agitated, which is easy to do, except when I'm agitated. But but God's in the pause. The pause is there for me to have a little prayer time. 
to say, God, I'm angry. It means I've judged. Bless me, please, that I don't judge. Please change this judgment and anger to sadness so that I can respond in sadness. Because sadness and love can travel together very nicely. Anger and love are mutually exclusive. And I'm trying to serve the God of love. And when I can come to you and say, I have a great sadness about fill in the blank. It is a very gentle, loving approach. If I come to you from anger, you have a tendency to defend. When I come with a great sadness, it can open both of our hearts. It's a whole different thing. I want to circle back to something that you talked about probably 20 minutes ago or so now. right? And that was the fact that you said that what prompted your separation is you started the internet porn. And yeah. that led into something else. I, can yeah. you talk to me a little bit about how you worked through that? Uh, how you counsel other guys that come to you with that same sort of issue? Um, talk to me about that a little bit. What I would say is if you're doing anything that's having a major negative effect on your life and you promise yourself you're never doing it again and you do it again anyway, we're not talking about character defect. We're talking about another addiction. And it might be time to explore another fellowship. I know there's several hundred other fellowships. And it may call for professional help or it may call for another fellowship. That's my explanation. That makes sense. Okay. So I, okay, you, you, there, there's a lot of people that are listening to you out there who um, either have they're thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or they have, or they're sober curious. They don't know exactly. There's a lot of people who listen to this that don't go to the program of AA. Right. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, I, I guess a final parting message around what the program has done for you, your experience, strength and hope uh, regarding the people that are listening that may be interested in something like this. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I got to look at the first. I had to look at the truth about myself. <clears throat> and the truth about me is I quit drinking forever over 2000 times. I'm a nose puker. I get drunk, I puke, and there's so much volume, it comes out my nose. And, uh, and I quit forever every time I puke out my nose, which for me added up to somewhere between two and 3000 times when I finally look at the truth. So my first question for someone who's not sure if they need to be here is, have you ever done anything? Have you ever sworn to yourself never again and yet found you were doing it again? Because the great truth for me is that alcohol was never a problem. It was never my problem, never for a single second, never, not once. It was my answer. It completed me. It made me feel like I was taller, smarter, better looking. I could talk to the girls. I was expert on many subjects, some of which I'd never even heard of. <laughs> A fantastic dancer. <laughs> right. So, so when I look at it, I got I to gotta be aware of my answers. Because my answer turned into a problem. It was an answer. And so that's why I couldn't lay it down and leave it down. The other thing I would say is if you've ever done anything to prove that you're not an alcoholic, the fact that you did something to prove <laughs> you're not an alcoholic proves that you are. Because non-alcoholics never do anything to prove they're not. They have no reason to. <laughs> So I would I would hope someone would ask, wow, have I quit forever before and met it and wasn't able to make it stick? And was it in fact my answer? Did it fulfill me? Did it fill something? The big piece that did for me, it made me feel like I was good enough. I never felt like I was good enough. I felt like I was defective. There were things wrong with me that couldn't be fixed. And and when I was awake, I was on a red alert trying to hold up the right mask to keep you from seeing the real me. Because clearly, a bunch of together people like you would never have a defective model like me around if you knew the truth. Mm -hmm. So if I'm awake, I'm on red alert trying to hold up the right mask. It takes a tremendous amount of energy. I don't know how much longer I could have done it. And I think alcohol and eventually some of alcohol's cousins Save my life until I could get to you. I don't know how much longer I could have done it. Alcohol's cousins. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Never heard of it that way. Scott, this has been uh, 
everything and more that I expected. I really, really appreciate your candor. Um, and um, I didn't know, I had no idea where this was going to go, um, but I'm glad we were able to talk to a couple different things. I, I, I missed a piece I like to put in too. I have a definition of a mistake. A mistake is an invitation to a lesson. That's all it is. The evidence is if I'd already learned the lesson, I would not have made a mistake. So the mistake is simply an invitation to a lesson. And the simple fact is I don't have the power to make a mistake so severe that this loving, laughing God can't turn it into something wonderful. I regularly, weekly, watch God use the very worst things I've ever done as tools to help other people. That is a powerful God. Amen. That's some powerful stuff, man. Powerful stuff. Amen, Scott. Amen. Yeah. So I'm here to make mistakes, and they've sent the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to the next one. All right, so we always close this out with page 164 from the big book. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Once again, Scott L., I really appreciate you coming on today. God bless you. Thanks a lot. I had a ball. <laughs>